goddamn dumb son of a bitch. You don't understand a word I'm saying, do you? If you don't allow V for Vendetta to force your brain into an alpha rhythm, which for those of you who don't know is the rhythm associated with daydreaming, if you pay any attention at all while watching V for Vendetta, you will find that the movie is loaded with all kinds of propaganda. Diversity is our strength propaganda, LGBT propaganda, anti-Christian propaganda, anarchist propaganda, all kinds of propaganda. You'll also find that there's a number of very cleverly placed number threes and number 33s. You'll also find that the movie's actually a really awful movie. It's just, it has an awful message. It has an awful development. For instance, this character, Evie, she is super freaking cringe. And she's also really dumb. And not only is she really dumb, but she actually, if you really watch the movie carefully, you'll find that she's participating in V's plan without actually knowing why V is doing what he's doing. Like, by the end of the movie, after he tortures her, she thinks that he's doing what he's doing because they tortured him in prison. Like, she actually never comes to the conclusion, or she never realizes the fact that the government was responsible for releasing the uh, the virus in this movie. I'm not talking about reality, our current reality. I'm talking about in this movie. She actually never realizes that in this movie. And it's really freaking hilarious. And actually, the fact that she never realizes the full truth in itself is very telling. That in itself has an interesting little hidden message in it. Because in this way, she's actually like the audience that admires this movie. She's like all of the people who emulate V or who look up to V. They don't really know what he's up to. They don't really know what this movie is really about. They watch it, they worship it, they idolize it. But really, it's a complete work of propaganda. But before I get into any of those points, I want to first cover the fact that the movie totally inverts and confuses Guy Fawkes and the gunpowder treason plot that took place on November 5th. Which actually ensures, like this movie ensures that nobody remembers the real November the 5th. Like, it completely inverts that. It completely inverts the truth about what took place on November the 5th, 1605. It completely confuses what actually happened. And you know what? I'm just going to get right into this. So let's get into the very beginning of the movie. Okay, so the movie starts off with the following line. Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Remember that. It's all like, I I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. But remember, I'm going to prove right now that this, this movie, it completely inverts what actually took place during the gunpowder treason plot. Okay, so, so let's see what else is, is said right after that. But what of the man? I know his name was Guy Fawkes, and I know in six. Yeah, yeah. But what of the man? Now, what's hilarious? Um, actually, you know what? I'll let this. I'll let this play for a little second longer. Do you know five? He attempted to blow up the houses of Parliament. But who was he really? What was he like? Yes. Who was he really? What was he like? This movie actually never covers that let me i'll let it play a little bit more i know i'm it's gonna be irritating i'm gonna stop the video from playing a couple of times because i don't want to be hit with a copyright strike even though i'm clearly commenting on this movie youtube and all of these creatures have it out for me so uh, i'm i'm gonna basically try to keep this to to like less than 10 second clips so let, let me let it keep playing We are told to remember the idea, not the man. So we are told to remember the idea 
and not the man. And it's hilarious because this movie completely confuses the idea and it completely confuses the man. Okay, so I'll, I'll let it keep playing. A man can fail. He can be caught. He can be killed and forgotten. But 400 years later, an idea can still change the world. Yeah, an idea can still change the world. I mean, you, you have to ask yourself, what idea exactly is there um, being suggested here? And we're gonna, I'm going to get into that. Actually, you know what? Yeah, I'll get into that later on. So I'll, I'll let this keep playing. I've witnessed firsthand the power of ideas. I've seen people kill in the name of them. Okay, whatever. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna skip ahead. So basically, sh they start the movie off with this point of like, you know, what about the man? And really, if you, if you're watching the movie and you're paying attention, it's trying to make it as if Guy Fox is like, you know, V is supposed to represent Guy Fox. That's why he has the Guy Fox mask, and it almost confuses. Well, not almost. It does confuse the audience into thinking that Guy Fox was this like uh, principled man who was like rational and who was you know just an absolutely brilliant person and then uh, at the end of the movie this question is actually asked who was he who's edmund dantes i love that face <laughs> who was he she's like he was edmund dantes and this look is is almost the look that i had at this point in the movie like, really? Like, you gotta be yanking my chain here. So I'll, I'll let this keep playing. And he's my father. And my mother. My brother. My friend. Uh, no, he wasn't. Okay, so then she goes into this whole tangent. He was you. And that's my face of just like, okay, um, this is all bullshit. And he was me. And, you know, that's essentially what this movie manages to do to people is, is actually um, kind of plant this V seed inside of everyone. Now, who was Guy Fox really? Because that's never answered in the movie. And actually, not only is it never answered in the movie, the movie actually inverts the entire thing. So Guy Fox was actually a Catholic extremist. Okay, this is the Guy Fox Wikipedia. And it actually doesn't really get into the idea that he was a Catholic extremist. So I'm going to have to elaborate upon that fact for you right after I read this Wikipedia. So Guy Fox, Guy Fox, April 13th, 1570 to 31st January 1606. Also known as Guido Fox, while fighting for the Spanish, was a member of a group of provincial English Catholics involved in the failed gunpowder plot of 1605. He was born and educated in York. His father died when Fox was eight years old, after which his mother married a recusant Catholic. Okay, so remember, he's a Catholic extremist. I'm going to be proving that, okay? So Fox converted to Catholicism and left for mainland Europe, where he fought for Catholic Spain. Check this shit out. He fought for Catholic Spain in the 80 years war against protestant dutch reformers in the low countries okay but i'm going to be getting into all of this shit really interesting history he traveled to spain to seek support for a catholic rebellion in england without success he later met thomas wintour with whom he returned to england wintour introduced him to robert catsby robert catsby who planned to assassinate King James I and restore a Catholic monarch to the throne. The plotters leased an undercroft beneath the House of the Lords. Fox was placed in charge of the gunpowder that they stockpiled there. Yada, yada, yada. We know the rest of the story. Okay, so now let me explain the history that has been concealed to everyone. So, very few people actually understand or even are aware of what happened at this moment in history. You talk to people about Protestants and Calvinists, they don't have a fucking clue as to really what you're talking about. So let me explain a little bit of this. I'm going to begin with the recusants, with the recusant Catholics, you know, because his mother married a recusant Catholic, okay? And this all plays into the Protestant uh, Reformation and all of that stuff. Actually, you know what? I should really begin with the 
English church becoming a Protestant church, okay? And actually, I'll, I'll get to that, so don't worry. We'll, we'll get there, okay? So let's begin with the recusance, okay? Or recusancy, okay? So recusancy, from Latin recursere, uh, literally mean to refuse, was the state of those who remained loyal to the Catholic church and refused to attend Church of England services after the English Reformation. The 1558 Recusancy Acts, passed in the reign of Elizabeth I and temporarily repealed in the Interregnum of 1649 to 1660, remained on the statute books until 1888. They imposed punishments such as fines, property confiscation, and imprisonment on recusants. The suspension under Oliver Cromwell was mainly intended to give relief to non-conforming Protestants rather than to Catholics to whom some restrictions applied into the 1920s. Through the Act of Settlement, 1701, despite the 1828 Catholic Emancipation. Actually, you know what? I forgot to include one thing when it comes to Guy Fawkes. So, uh, originally, um, in England... This is how Guy Fawkes Day was originally celebrated. So Fox was sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. However, at his execution on 31st January, he died when his neck was broken as he was hanged, with some sources claiming that he deliberately jumped to make this happen. He thus avoided the agony of his sentence. That's kind of funny. They would hang him, they would cut him down before he would die, and then they would quarter him. Now, I'll, I'll get into why he was sentence for that it actually has to do with treason and not because he was a catholic which is an important point that we're gonna have to cover uh so he became synonymous with the gunpowder plot the failure of which has been commemorated in the united kingdom as guy fox night since 5th november 1605 when his effigy is traditionally burned on a bonfire commonly accompanied by fireworks so before november the 5th would actually celebrate the death or the execution of this guy. But after V for Vendetta, people don't celebrate his death anymore. They celebrate him. He's like some kind of martyr, some sort of superhero that people look up to because they're ignorant. And the movie V for Vendetta has inverted our historical reality. So anyway, returning back to this Wikipedia page. In some cases, those adhering to Catholicism faced capital punishment. And some English and Welsh Catholics who were executed in the 16th and 17th centuries have been canonized by the Catholic Church as martyrs of the English Reformation. Now, what this Wikipedia lacks, the information that it lacks here, is that these people did not face capital punishment because they were Catholics. It wasn't because they were adhering to Catholicism. It's because they were found guilty of treason. Just like Guy Fawkes was sent to be executed because he was found guilty of treason, they didn't just simply execute Catholics because they were Catholics. They executed them because there was actually a Catholic extremism at this time where Catholics and Protestants were actually at war with each other. And we even see that when we just look at Guy Fawkes' Wikipedia and the fact that he went to Catholic Spain to participate in the 80-year war against the Protestant Dutch reformers in the Low Countries. And in the 80-year war, over 100,000 Dutch were killed. Why were they killed? Because they were Protestant, and they were a threat to the Catholic Church. So Guy Fox is a complete Catholic fucking bigot extremist piece of shit, and we should burn his effigy every November the 5th, because he's a fucking dirtbag. There wasn't just the 80-year war, there was also the 30-year war. There was all-out war between Protestants and Catholics. And that's actually why this, uh, these recusancy acts came into being in 1558. So European wars of religion okay, fought after the Protestant Reformation began in 1517. So let's look at the European War of Religion. It was a series of wars waged in Europe during the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. Fought after the Protestant Reformation began in 1517, the wars disrupted the religious and political order in the Catholic countries of Europe, or Christendom. Other motives during the wars involved revolt, territorial ambitions, and great power conflicts. Okay, so there were these wars of religion that occurred in Europe. And the reason these wars of religion broke out is they broke out because of Catholics, because of Catholic extremists. Now, why did these wars actually break out? They broke out because the Roman Catholic Church 
had basically a monopoly on power. This is another website. I'm going to just read a little bit from it. So the rottenness of the Roman Catholic Church was at the heart of Martin Luther's attack on it in 1517 when he wrote the 95 Thesis, thus sparking off the German Reformation. So in 1500, the Roman Catholic Church was all-powerful in Western Europe. There was no legal alternative. The Catholic Church jealously guarded its position, and anybody who was deemed to have gone against the Catholic Church was labeled a heretic and burnt at the stake. The Catholic Church did not tolerate any deviance from its teachings as any appearance of going soft might have been interpreted as a sign of weakness which would be exploited. Okay, now I'm going to just talk a little bit about the Inquisition. So there's some articles out there that are like, oh yeah, the Inquisition, it wasn't really that bad. And, and I'm going to just look at some of the propaganda surrounding the Inquisition. Okay, so this is some of the propaganda. So um, I, I guess I can just go, I, I'll, I'll read it actually. One of the many myths surrounding the Inquisition is that the Catholic Church was brutally executing scores of innocent people by drowning them or burning them at the stake. In the symposiums titled The Inquisition, What Really Happened, April 20th, co-sponsored by the Lehman Christi Institute and the Medieval Studies Workshop, scholars Hannah Marcus, Stanford University, Daniel Magulia, University of Chicago, and Ada Palmer, University of Chicago also, sought to clarify the numerous misconceptions surrounding the infamous period. For one, the church itself is never executing, remarked Palmer, assistant professor of history, associate faculty of classics, and member of the Stovovich Institute of the Formation of Knowledge at the University of Chicago. There is no inquisitor tying people's feet and then dropping them in the canal. On the contrary, the most common sentences meted out by the Inquisition were that heretics recite Hail Marys or sit through really boring lectures. There were very few burnings and drownings, said Palmer. Furthermore, the church didn't have the authority to execute anyone. That was the prerogative of the state. They would recommend that a heretic be executed, and then local government authorities would carry out the sentence. These people, I mean, this propaganda, this sort of inversion of history, this sort of muddying of the waters of truth, to me is just intolerable. So let's look at this, okay? So, I mean, it's very simple. Anybody who knows about the need for the separation of church and state knows that the church and the state back then were very well tied together, okay? So the church was not simply a religion and an institution. It was a category of thinking and a way of life. In medieval Europe, the church and the state were closely linked. It was the duty of every political authority, king, queen, prince, or city council member, to support, sustain, and nurture the church. Okay, so this idea that's like, oh no, it wasn't the church executing people, it was the state. It's just, it's just a complete, it's like almost something that you'll find on these fact-checking websites. Where it's like, oh no, he didn't say that, he said uh, this flavor of that, which is really the same thing as that. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is how many people actually died during the Inquisition? How many heretics were killed? And you're going to find a ridiculous number. You're going to find that it ranged from 30,000 to 300,000. Now, of course, the people who say 30,000 are the people who are trying to downplay it. And I believe it, it was actually well over 300,000. If you look at the Muslim and Jewish population in Spain uh, that, that were killed for refusing to convert, it was probably well over 300,000. So now I'm going to actually bring it back to this work of propaganda. So this claim over here that people were, you know, they were just forced to recite some Hail Marys or sit through really boring lectures. That was if they would convert. If they chose to convert to Catholicism, then they were just basically forced to recite Hail Marys. But if a person refused to convert, if they chose to maintain their religion, then they were fucking executed. Okay, they don't really talk about that here, but that's the facts. Okay, and that was what the Catholics were doing. And specifically, that's what the Catholics were doing in the Spanish Inquisition. Now, why was the Inquisition so bad in Spain? Uh, I have some other articles here that I can pull up, but you know what? I'll just save us some time. 
And I'll say that the reason why the Spanish Inquisition was so bad in Spain is because Spain is kind of closer to North Africa. And by closer to, to North Africa, I mean North Africa is like right across the Mediterranean from Spain. And basically, Spain had like one of the most diverse populations in Europe at the time. So what happened is uh, when the Inquisition kicked off, there were simply more Muslim and Jewish populations in Spain than in other European countries. And those populations, they were basically told, convert or die. And those who didn't convert died. That's exactly what happened. So now let me look at some of these religious wars. Uh, so I'm going to look at who started the Thirty Years' War. Now the person who started the Thirty Years' War was the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II. Though the struggle of the Thirty Years' War erupted some years earlier, the war is conventionally held to have begun in 1618, when the future Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II attempted to impose Roman Catholic absolutism on his domains, and the Protestant nobles of both Bohemia and Austria rose up in rebellion. Okay, so essentially what happened was, even before the Thirty Years' War, like right after the Protestant Reformation kicked off, there was already subjugation and abuse of Protestants. And of course, we already saw that with the 80 Years' War that Guy Fox was personally involved in that saw over 100,000 Dutch killed for being Protestant. And I'm going to get into Protestantism in a second. But then what happened was, you know, 1618, you see here, uh, this Holy Roman Emperor, he decided that he was going to impose Roman Catholic absolutism. Now, I know this happened after Guy Fox, but this still demonstrates how extreme Catholics were at this time, how desperate they were to hold on to their power that the Protestants were chipping away at. So this guy was like, no, 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 everyone in my dominion must be Roman Catholic, and those who aren't Roman Catholic must die. And this was basically another flavor of the Inquisition, and this is what makes me laugh, is that this number for the Spanish Inquisition that I showed before, the 30 to 300,000, it only is talking about Spain. This is only talking about Spain, and it's actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't looked into all of the studies, but I'm sure it's only accounting not only just for Spain, but I'm sure it's also only accounting for uh, probably a century and a half of history. But what happened in the 30-year war, how many people died in the 30-year war? Let's check this out, okay? So the human toll. The 30 years war is thought to have claimed between 4 and 12 million lives. Around 450 people died in combat alone. Disease and famine took the lion's share of the death toll. Estimates suggest that 20% of Europe's people perished, with some areas seeing their population fall by as much as 60%. This is also kind of confusing at the disease and famine. There was actually uh, a trade block that was put on Germany, and Germany was actually the portion of Europe, or it's actually the part of Europe, that lost as much as 60% of their population. And we actually I believe we have that here. Um, this is another Google search. It also gives a little bit different numbers because they try to massage the data here. So fought primarily in Central Europe, an estimated 4.5 to 8 million soldiers and civilians died as a result of battle, famine, and disease, while some areas of what is now modern Germany experienced population declines of over 50%. So the point is, is that Guy Fox was a Catholic extremist who wanted to get rid of Protestantism in England. Now, Protestantism is way better than Catholicism. If you look up why Protestantism came to England, you'll find that Protestantism came to England because King Henry III wanted a divorce. He wanted to get divorced so that he can have a male heir. The wife that he was with wasn't producing him a male heir, so he wanted to get a divorce. The Catholic Church was like, hell no. And this actually shows the power of the Catholic Church, and that the Catholic Church actually had power over the state. Because the king would be a representative of the state, but the Catholic Church actually had control over him, and was telling him, no, you can't get divorced. So what the king did, what King Henry III did, was said, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to then convert over to Protestantism because Protestantism actually is a more liberal religion than Catholicism. And, and Protestantism allowed for divorce. And what's interesting is that Protestantism eventually became Calvinism. And, well, it didn't become Calvinism. It branched off 
and basically Calvinism was a, a more pure form of Protestantism. Protestantism kind of became corrupt once uh, King Henry III became Protestant. It, it became kind of political. And then uh, in, in England, it went from Protestant to Catholicism, and then some Catholicism influenced Protestantism, and Protestantism basically became corrupt, and then that led to Calvinism and Puritanism, uh, which b both of them tried purifying or at least getting Protestantism back on track. But once again, that didn't happen because it became political, it got tied into the, the monarchy and, and there's a whole clusterfuck that happened there. But Protestantism is a much more liberal religion than Catholicism. And I, what I want to say about Calvinism, which is a purer f form of Protestantism, is that I actually managed to use the Calvinist belief for my religious exemption letter. And this is actually why I believe they went to great lengths to bury and muddy the waters of Calvinism and Puritanism, because really these religions, if you really understand them, they actually can free you from government tyranny in a lot of freaking ways. So they've done a lot of work to bury those religions and to muddy those religions. But the point is, is that this guy, Guy Fox, is a Catholic extremist who fought in Spain, and Spain, remember, was they had the most bloody uh, Inquisition, or at least the most bloody form of the Inquisition. So you can say he was happy with the Inquisition. But V for Vendetta makes it as if Guy Fox is like some, some like anti-religious hero, like as if he's not a religious extremist, and they do this through the story of V, because V, he's at battle with, you know, this super religious um, state of England in, in the movie V for Vendetta. They, they paint England as like this super, like, Christianized extreme state that, that hates things that are different. When in reality, this government is a better reflection of the Catholic regime that Guy Fox was fighting for in 1605. It is a complete inversion of historical reality. And it's just insane. It's absolutely insane what this movie is actually doing, and people aren't even seeing it. But anyway, now that I've covered the whole Guy Fox, you know, switcheroo that this movie is doing, this Guy Fox propaganda that they're promoting here, let's look at some clips that I found to be pretty interesting. Some clips that are clearly promoting anti-Christian propaganda, pro-LGBT propaganda, this diversity is our strength propaganda, and all that other good stuff. You know, at the start of the movie, not at the start, but like, you know, pretty early on in the movie, they have uh, this guy playing on the TV and he says the following. To go, strength through unity, unity through faith. I'm a God-fearing Englishman and I'm goddamn proud of it. That's quite enough of so this is sort of part of this anti-Christian propaganda. This is this uh, not only anti-Christian propaganda, but also this anti-unity propaganda. This like, oh no, no, unity isn't the answer. Those people who are seeking unity are just tyrannical nutcases. But uh, you know what? Before I even continue on, let me just show some of the Masonic symbolism, some of the 33 symbolism that can be found in this movie. I'm sorry, I know this video, it's going to be kind of like, a, I'm definitely rushing it. I'm a, on a short time. So I'm going to apologize at this point. I thought I was a little bit more prepared for this video, but then I over-prepared for it and ran out of time. But anyway, let me quickly show who is really behind this movie. I'm going to show you that the club has their messaging all over this movie. I'm actually not messaging. They have their symbolism all over this movie. So let's look at some 33 symbolism. Everyone else, let's go. Oh, oh, look, look at that. Oh, I mean, the countdown, I mean, the, the counter just happens to be at 30, 30 here. I'm sorry, uh, at 3, 30 here. 3 minutes and 30 seconds. And what's interesting is that they don't show the 3 minutes, 33 seconds. For some reason, they decide to, like, pan the camera away or they decide to do it at this point, okay? So now, um, let me just quickly look at another scene here, okay? So check this out. There are 872 songs in here. 
872 songs in here. And then he goes on to say, I've listened to them all, but I've never danced to any of them. And then he, you know, and then she's like, did you hear me? He's like, yes. Well, 872. Okay, so 8 minus 7 is 1. Plus 2, we have the number 3. Now, I know people are going to say, oh, no, you're doing what this guy Gematria effect does. You know, you're just grasping at straws here. You're smoking too much weed. Yada, 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 yada. But don't worry, I'm going to cover that, okay? Don't worry, because don't worry. The movie actually says, and I'm going to show that, the movie actually says that there's no such thing as coincidences three times in the movie. But I'll get into that in a second. Let me just look at a, some more three symbolism and 33 symbolism. Three is one more failure. 347 days, gentlemen. 347 failures! Chancellor. So this is towards the end of the movie where it's getting closer to November the 5th when he's supposed to blow up Parliament. And the head here is all like, 347 days, gentlemen. That's how many days have passed since V kind of um, came out to the public. It's like, that's 347 failures. Well, 3, and then you got 47. 7 minus 4 gives you another 3. So you sort of have a 33 here. Now, I know people can be like, no, 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 this, this is just a coincidence. You're just looking into things. Don't worry, I'm going to cover that. Okay, let me, let's just look at one more three that's just kind of hidden in there. Life should end in such a terrible place. But for three years, I had roses and apologized to no one. Oh, look at that. For three years, she had roses and apologized to no one. Okay. Now, uh, for those people who are like, oh, these are just coincidences, uh, you know, those are just numbers that these people pulled out of their asses, you know, the people who wrote these scripts, you know, that number, they just pulled it right out of their ass or right out of the air. Actually, what happened was the people who wrote this script, they actually didn't even write it. What happened was these letters came out of the air and just landed themselves on the paper and have no meaning whatsoever, right? Well, check this out. How many times in the movie... Do they say that there's no such thing as coincidences? Uh, let, let, let's look, okay? Let's count them. Coincidence. I should be given one today. There are no coincidences, Delia. Only the illusion of coincidence. So he tells this lady, this uh, nurse, there's no coincidences. Only the illusion of coincidence. Okay, that's one. He tells her that, right? Then, at the, of course, once um, V meets Evie... And she's all like, oh, yeah, my name's Evie. And he's like, oh, oh what, how, how strange. Or, or he's like, oh, actually, he says, of course your name is Evie. And then she's like, uh, what do you mean by that? And then V tells her the following. Like God, do not play with dice and do not believe in coincidence. Are you hurt? Okay, he does not believe in coincidence, okay? And, and guess what? The third time that they say in the movie that they don't believe in coincidence is this guy right here. But this as long as I've been, you stop believing in coincidence. Okay, so three separate times in the movie, they basically say there's no such thing as coincidence. Alrighty. Now, um, let's just, now that we, we see that there is the club symbolism in the movie, we see who's behind this, we see that they're inverting history and all that stuff, let's look at some of the LGBT propaganda and the diversity is our strength propaganda. The first time we kissed... I knew I never wanted to kiss any other. Kid. So you got this lady here who's uh, like, you know, she was apparently in the cell next to V. She just happens to be a lesbian, right? And not only is she a lesbian, she actually goes through three different girlfriends. If you pay attention, she had um, the the girlfriend that she met at school. Like the she was like, oh, I, I, I fell in love with her wrist. And then she falls out of the picture. There's no mention of her. Then she has the girlfriend that she apparently it was like her first love. Actually, no, it says that the other girl that she met in school, the first girl that she loved, grew out of it. Uh, remember, her parents tell her, like, oh, yeah, you'll grow out of it. It's just the stage. So the other girl grew out of it. Then she had another girl who she fell in love with. No, and then when she, like, told her parents that she was basically still gay, they kicked her out of the house. And then she just completely falls out of the picture. And then she meets this lady who's, like, basically, um, uh, they, they get taken away by the uh by the government okay by the state now now uh let's let's look at the uh diversity is our strength propaganda powerful i remember how different became dangerous yes different became dangerous 
Now, this is all part of the reverse psychology operation that's going on in this movie. Where it's like, oh yeah, look at these people, look at this tyrannical government, you know, they think that different is dangerous. That means that that we have to, to do the opposite of this, and we have to say that different is actually great. Difference is our strength, diversity is our strength. That's basically the messaging that's going on here. That's going, you know, people are just like not even connecting with it, but it's, it's being implanted into them. Okay, so let's uh, let this play through though. Why they hate us so so and after you have um, the the two um, lesbians, and, and I just want to say, I don't think there's anything wrong with being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. You do whatever you want. I'm just simply pointing out the propaganda that exists in this movie. I'm just simply pointing out that this movie does have this messaging in it. Am I saying the messaging is bad or good or, or whatever? No, not really. I'm neutral about it. I'm just simply pointing it out. People can think whatever they want, okay? So, after you have the two girls, the very next scene, you have these two guys who are in bed, and of course, you know, you, you have the, the white guy and the black guy, right? So, check this out. It, it sort of looks like a girl at first. At first, when I first watched this movie, I, I thought it was a girl, but then, if you look at the very next scene, that's the black guy. He gets hit in the stomach with the gun. He gets bagged. And then the other guy gets bagged. Okay, so so you do have this LGBT propaganda in this movie. And then after that, you have this this propaganda that makes absolutely no sense, which is you have this anti-Christian messaging all throughout the movie, but then check out what they do with Islam. Check out what they do with the Quran. It's a copy of the Quran, 14th century. But why would you keep it? I don't have to be Muslim to find the images beautiful or it's poetry moving. Okay. The reason that this is ridiculous is because this guy is actually himself gay. It's like revealed in the, around this scene that he's gay, but yet he, he says that, that he doesn't have to be Muslim to find the images beautiful, the poetry moving, and he's talking about the Quran. So let's look at what the Quran says about the LGBT community. And it's hilarious because people have like claimed that, no, the Quran isn't against LGBT ideas, right? So let's let's look at this, okay? So uh, there are five references in the Quran which have been cited as referring to gay and lesbian behavior. Some obviously deal with effeminate men and masculine women. The two main references to homosexual behavior are, we also sent Lot, which is supposed to be Lot. He said to his people, do ye commit lewdness such as no people in creation ever committed before you? For ye practice your lust on men in preference to women. Ye are indeed a people transgressing beyond bounds. What? Of all creatures do ye come unto the males and leave the wives your Lord created for you? Nay, but ye are forward folk. Okay, both references relate to gay sexual activities. Lesbian practices are not mentioned in the Quran. Lot is referred to as Lot in the Hebrew scriptures. The passage is an apparent reference to the activities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so Islam and these other religions, they believe that a person should follow the holy scriptures. And they basically look at the holy scriptures and they say, look, God, it says in the Bible at least, that God created woman for man, like as for their wife. So those people who, who don't go with a woman, so basically sees this as like a, a rejection of God's creation or a rejection of how God created um, humans. So that's why Islam, or at least uh, certain sects of Islam, most sects of Islam, are against homosexuality. But I mean, it's crazy. We know, I'm sure everybody who's watching this knows, that there are Islamic countries who throw gay people off of buildings. Okay, but yet this movie has the, the gall, the audacity to have a gay character say that he doesn't need to be Muslim to find the images beautiful and the poetry moving. I mean, just I'm curious, if you made it this far into the video, please put in the comment section, did anybody catch this? Did anybody catch the complete inversion or the complete contradiction that is actually in this scene? The complete stupidity. I mean, to me, it's just complete stupidity. Who would even write this into a script and then say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, a gay guy having the Quran and then saying he doesn't need to be Muslim to find the images beautiful and the poetry moving. I mean, it's, it's absurd. It's completely insane, especially when in this 
context of the anti-Christian messaging that you find in this movie. But anyway, let's move on. But anyway, let's move on to the next clip that I want to share with everyone. He's a deeply religious man and a member of the Conservative Party. He's completely single-minded and has no regard for the political process. The more power... I mean, it's, it's brilliant, right? Like, it's like, yeah, man, he's fucking... It's like this crazy, he's deeply religious man, and he's a member of the Conservative Party. And then who it is, who is it? It's like the main, main villain or the main bad guy. But let's move on to the, the next anti-Christian clip. What? The world's biggest leper colony. Why? Godlessness. Let me say that again. And of course, this is early on in the movie. You have this guy on the TV. He's all like, oh yeah, all of this stuff happened because of godlessness. And then of course, in the, as the movie develops, it turns out that no, it had nothing to do with godlessness. It had everything to do with the government creating and releasing the virus themselves. So, I mean, it's all part of the reverse psychology of painting the bad guy in a certain light that makes people not want to be like that bad guy <clears throat> and want to be more like the hero of the story, want to be more like V. And this is actually, um, if people are familiar with the saying, um, as above, so below, I forget the exact, uh, there's an exact word for this. But the true meaning of this, like the true meaning of as above, so below, has to do with the stars and has to do with that what happens in, in the heaven or what happens with the stars, um, the people on the earth or the people below basically follow the stars. And I believe that this is why celebrities are called stars. And this is why they get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And as, as what the stars do, the people beneath them also do. As above, so below. But anyway, of course, there's a whole bunch of different... Um, interpretations of that saying but um i'm gonna now look at some of the clever stuff that is said in the, in the movie so evie says the following about her father in this clip he used to say that artists use lies to tell the truth while politicians use them to cover the truth up mm, a man after my own heart so artists use lies to tell the truth while politicians use lies to cover up the truth I mean, I, I find that messaging pretty interesting. I'll, I'll let you guys think of it what you may. But later on in the in the movie, V basically tells her the same thing. After he tortures her, he says the following. So that artists use lies to tell the truth. Yes, I created a lie. But because you believed it, you found something true about yourself. No. But anyway, um... What's interesting is later on, the following is said, okay? Uh, actually, not later on, actually, pretty early on when when E.V. is like with V, uh, she's cleaning off this mirror and it says the following on it. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. That's about trying to cheat the devil, isn't it? It is. Now, I mean, when you think about the inversions, when you think about she's looking at a mirror which inverts or, you know, well, actually, yeah, a mirror sort of inverts the image in a way. Uh, I mean, it's pretty interesting, you know, is he trying to cheat the devil or is he trying to cheat God? And it's interesting that, you know, by the power of truth, I mean, this I haven't fully digested. I haven't fully meditated on what possible meaning this could have, but I find it very interesting. And I find it also very interesting that V says this while killing the bishop. Thus I clothe my naked villainy with old odd ends, stolen forth from holy writ, and seem a saint when most I play the devil. Now what's interesting is that here, when a person watches this, you know, it could be interpreted like he's talking about the bishop here. But I think he's actually talking about himself. Let's, let's look at what he's saying here, okay? And thus I clothe my naked villainy. And remember, villainy, a per, it's a V word. And to me, he is V, right? His naked villainy, My naked villainy with... with old odd ends stolen forth from holy writ. You know, he is technically clothing his naked villainy with old odd ends, Guy Fox, stolen forth from holy writ, Guy Fox, because he was a Catholic extremist. There's sort of a holy connection there. Holy writ. And seem a saint... When most I play the devil. 
And this is interesting because, yeah, of course, it can, this can apply to the bishop, but it can also apply to V. If we really understand the messaging in this movie, V seems a saint when really he is playing the devil in this movie. He's actually, and I, I'll get into that in, in a moment, but let's, let's look at, at what the purpose of this movie really is. So I believe the purpose of this movie is revealed to us in this scene right here. This is exactly what he wants. What? Anarchy in the UK! Chaos. I believe that this is actually a huge part of the V for Vendetta messaging. This sort of anarchy messaging. This sort of messaging that the only way to solve our problems is by killing people and blowing shit up. Because that's the methods that V uses to exact his revenge or to achieve his goals. And really, if you, I mean, you have the anarchy coloring all over the movie. You have black and red all over the movie. You have a lot of anarchy messaging going on in the movie where, oh yes, the only solution, as I said, is to blow shit up. And what's interesting is that some people have said that V for Vendetta is sort of revealing the future. Some people have said that V for Vendetta could be foreshadowing the covid virus i mean there's a lot of things in the movie like there's a mystery virus like when you look at the news articles it's like mystery virus kills these people and when the covid pandemic started it was called a mystery virus and they were like oh this mystery virus is causing pneumonia it's like causing or, or pneumonia being triggered by mystery virus and i believe that it sort of was trying to to set people up so that when this moment happens and people catch on to what's really going on, instead of them using indirect methods to achieve their goals, instead of using indirect methods for solving our problems, they instead resort to violence, anarchy, chaos, killing people, blowing things up, and basically going batshit crazy. And I think that's actually the case. There's a lot of people, when you talk to them, I'm sure that if you talk to a lot of these thugs and stuff on the street, they believe that it's okay what they're doing because the government does worse. It's sort of like this George Santos guy who like lied and, and he cheated to basically get into office. And he's like, oh, well, there's, there's nothing wrong with me doing this because this is what the government did or this is what other politicians do. And it's this idea that two wrongs make a right. That, hey, if the government is behaving lawlessly, if the government is getting away with all of these supposed conspiracies, then guess what? Other people think, then can also go ahead and act like fucking maniacs. And it's this weird, I'm telling you, it's this really weird reverse psychology. It's this really weird psychological manipulation to get the masses to behave in a certain manner because it allows the government to get bigger. Anarchy and chaos is not the answer, okay? There's a saying, it's like police create hippies and hippies create police. And it's this like self-perpetuating cycle, the snake eating its tail. I mean, it's, it's fucking awful. And, and I know I'm doing a pretty banged up job at explaining it, at articulating it. But this is the best that I can do with the means that I have. Those who can do better, by all means, do better. Expand upon what I'm putting forth here. Clean it up a little bit. Refine it a little bit. Do what you can. If you can do it better than I can, I beg of you, do it better than I can. P put a bigger budget behind this. I have fucking no budget basically at all. I'm just a fucking single person on my laptop with Final Cut Pro. That's it. That's all I have. I have Final Cut Pro and I have Coral Painter 2021 that allows me to make my thumbnails. But those who have a bigger budget, please expand upon this. Because this is what's really happening in this movie. All of these, these, these movies that are like cult classics, all of these movies that have a, a major influence on our culture and that people, they worship them and they love them, I can guarantee you every single one of them has some kind of jacked up messaging. Just like Fight Club, just like I revealed with Fight Club. Same thing with V for Vendetta, but it's worse. At least Fight Club... They were just sort of laughing at us. And of course, they also have the anarchy messaging in Fight Club. But V for Vendetta, they do it in a very, very clever way. But anyway, let's, uh, let, let's look at this next clip, okay? I'm sorry for that long digression. The problem is that he knows us better than we know ourselves. See, that's just like the club. 
the club knows us better than we know ourselves. V is like, I mean, he serves the club. I know he's a fictional character, but this whole movie, it's serving the club's purpose. It's serving the club's agenda. Let's uh, let's look at the, uh, there, there's something else here that I find interesting. This scene, I caught this clip. Um, I'm going to play the clip in a second, but I don't know if this is Evie here and this is like V in the mirror if V wasn't, I guess, tortured or whatever. Or I think this actually might be the lesbian chick. And uh, where's, where, where is she? Here she is. Um, I, I know I have her picture here. Um, where is it? Uh, it's actually over here. Yeah, so it's sort of, actually, maybe it's not her. I thought it was the lesbian chick. Maybe it's just Evie, and it's just like some sort of alternative reality. I think there might actually be something else going on here, which is that like, uh, actually, I'll get into it because there's a clip at the end of the movie, which sort of reveals um, something here. But anyway, I'm going to play this clip because this is just like some random scene that I thought was interesting in, in the movie because it actually it's a scene that never plays in the movie in this whole clip. They show things that played in the movie, but this one clip does not happen in the movie. So let's play this clip and let's hear what they say. It was like a perfect partner laid out in front of me. And I realized that we were all part of it and all trapped by it. So it's a perfect pattern. So he says, it was like a perfect pattern laid out in front of me. And I realized that we were all part of it. And all trapped by it. And that's exactly what I think this movie is doing. It's it like has put out this perfect pattern of events. It put out this perfect script that would reel everyone in. It would make everyone part of it. But it would also trap everyone with it. And it's, a, it's really clever messaging. I mean, maybe I haven't fully digested it. But I find it to be a very, very interesting line in the movie. But anyway, let's let's look at this um, uh, um, this other clip, okay? So this is like another, I feel like, hidden truth in the movie. Let's check it out. Our enemy is an insidious one, seeking to divide us and destroy the very foundation of our great nation. So, I mean, this is true. This is what's actually happening in reality. And this is like this whole thing where it's like they use lies. And this takes me back to what Evie says about her father. He's like, uh, where she's like, he, they use lies to tell the truth. This is exactly what they're doing in this movie. They're using lies to tell us the truth. But we don't see it because of this perfect pattern and this reverse psychology that, ha that has us actually, you know, not even believing the truth. Actually, it has us believing the opposite of the truth. And it's interesting to, you know, destroy the foundation of our great nation. I mean, to me, it's it's freaking brilliant. Like this movie, um, is just it's just absolutely brilliantly designed to brainwash people without them ever realizing that they were just brainwashed. You know, this takes me right back to Fight Club, where in that movie theater scene where he flashes the dick in the family movies, and people don't realize that they just saw a dick. Nobody knows that they saw it, but they did. Nice big cock. This movie is brainwashing people, and they don't have a fucking clue that they're being brainwashed. Actually, the complete opposite. They're actually all worshipping it and wearing their fucking Guy Fox mask on Halloween, acting like they're fucking against the system, and acting like they're some independent-minded people. It's like, no, no, no. You're fucking brainwashed idiots. Now... Another thing that I want to point out is this messaging that's also in the movie. The the hope and change propaganda. Check this out. Why are you doing this? Because he was right. About what? That this country needs more than a building right now. It needs hope. Just super cringy. Now, of course, what's interesting about this whole uh, hope propaganda is that V for Vendetta came out in 2005. Well before Obama came out with his hope and change campaign. So, I mean, it's just, to me, it's brilliant that this scene is in the movie. Of course, it's super fucking cringy. It's like, oh, yeah, we need hope. And what's crazy is that this is what a lot of counterintelligence um, 
talking heads clearly do on all of these streaming sites on BitChute, on on youtube a lot of these obvious counterintelligent agents they're all about filling people with hope we don't need fucking hope man we need truth we need truth honesty and reality hope does not exist in truth honest and reality okay it just doesn't okay you have to be realistic with yourself not hopeful with yourself you don't have to you don't hope that things are a certain way you have to know things are a certain way but anyway now i'm going to wrap this up um, i'm going to yeah i'm going to wrap this video up with um what i think is uh one of the dumbest sequence of events in movie history and and it just shows how dumb this character is this character evie right so so after v saves her right v saved her at the beginning from getting raped and then um, at the at the studio when she maces the officer, he saves her. And then when he's all like, sorry, I can't let you leave. If I let you leave, they're going to torture you and kill you and try to use you to find out where I am. He explains this to her in a very nice way. And then she has this ridiculous emotional outburst. Sorry, Evie. I didn't know what else to do. You should have left me alone. Why didn't you just leave me alone? Yeah, why don't you just leave her alone and let the fingerman basically probably rape her to death on that night that she was out past curfew? I mean, it makes no sense. Especially, this makes no sense, because it's not like she's ignorant to the way that the government is in this movie. It's not like she thinks the government is like a, a loving, cherishing government. She knows the government is filled with bad guys because they killed her own family. Well, at least they took out her mo Actually, yeah, I think they, they killed her brother her her father and her mother and she's like oh you should have just left me alone and but then check this out it gets better right so in the next morning Mademoiselle? i just wanted to apologize for my reaction last night hmm. i understand what you did for me and i want you to know i am grateful so then she's all like oh yeah i'm super grateful i'm just you know just bipolar personality right and and then later on i think it, yeah this I, I don't think this is the same scene i think this is like a couple days later i think that like he uh like after this scene he goes and he kills like the the colonel the the talking head he kills the guy in the shower and i believe a day passes and then she comes to him and then says the following i know this world is screwed up believe me i know it better than most which is why i wanted to ask if there's anything i can do to help make it right so you know she knows the world is screwed up she knows it better than anybody else because remember, they took out her parents. They basically are responsible for the death of her brother. She's like, oh, yeah, I want to help you. But then, but then when she goes to help him, she actually tries to turn him in. And she's all like, oh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to help you guys. You know, this guy's going to kill you here. I'll play this scene. I love the confessional game. Tell me your sins. This isn't a game, Your Grace. Someone's coming and I think he means to kill you. And then she just basically tries to turn him in. And, and, and it's just absolutely ridiculous. Like, how can a person write this into a script and be like, yeah, this makes sense. I mean, I guess it's like, I don't know what it's supposed to say about her character. I mean, I, I guess people do exist like this in reality. And that's the sad part is that there are people that are this stupid in reality. So I guess it fits in. I guess it actually makes sense. But to me, I just find it so cringy. It's like, wow, really? Like... And, and of course, this all sets up so that she can go over to the to the other guy's house and he can show her the Quran and, and he can get killed for having the Quran. And I mean, it leads this stupidity leads into other propaganda. And to me, it just really bothers me. To me, I just see it as like very, very bad writing. I don't like movies whose plots are driven by the stupidity of characters. To me, that's just like that's not how a plot should develop or that's not how a story should develop but anyway i want to point out one more thing and that is that at the end of the movie we see characters that are supposed to be dead so this little girl here she's supposed to be dead she's supposed to have been shot by police remember v sends the mask to everyone to trigger the chaos and to get people to rise up but then it shows her alive at the end and not only does it show that she's alive at the end, but check this out. These are the two lesbians. These are the two girls. This is, this is the, the girl who was like his, um, his cellmate, and this was her lover. 
and, and not only does it show them alive, but it also shows the guy, the her boss, who who's like the guy who has the Quran. He's also shown in this crowd. So to me, this says that like they were all working together. And this is like a really interesting message, like a really subtle and hidden message at the end of the movie where it's like, yeah, they were all working together. They were all working together uh, to, to do whatever, right? Like, I, I guess to trick or convince Evie to go and blow up Parliament. Because remember, Evie actually, if you watch the movie, she doesn't realize that the government did this stuff with the virus. She's kind of out of that whole loop. So to me, this is like, saying, yeah, you know what, V, the government, they were actually working together, and that's actually exactly what's going on in the movie. The movie, V is working with the club, he seems like he's an anti-club hero, but in reality, the V and this whole movie is clearly with the club. So here, it's like showing all these people were with the club. I don't know, that's, that's at least how I see it. This movie is fucking awful. It's a terrible fucking movie. It's a awful work of propaganda and it's really unfortunate that people don't see it for what it really is and that is that it's something that's trying to manipulate your mind that's trying to manipulate your psychology and it's just it's just a really fucked up movie god damn it a son of a bitch sat there and spoon fed me that bullshit and i ate it up